So it's pretty obvious that the world has had an issue with race for quite some time. The question is, should the church also look at it as an issue? Because many of us don't really think that it is. You know, church is for more spiritual issues, mm. right? Um, well, it sounds like you're promoting a social gospel, which I always found weird because Christianity has to be one of the most social phenomenons that's ever hit the planet. It's all about being social. So what should someone who subscribes to a biblical worldview look at racism? Well, I propose to you that we need to look at it as complete rebellion towards God. It is a sin issue. Now, how is this a sin issue? Well, we are rebelling from the identity that God has given us and traded that identity for one that the world has provided. Now, what does that mean? Well, to understand that, you have to understand what God's designation for us is. And you don't have to go too deep into the Bible to know what that is. It's in the first book. It's in the first chapter. Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. You know, for those of us who haven't cracked open the Bible in a long time, I got you. Right? First book, first chapter. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So the Bible says that God says that we are his image. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean that we look like God? Well, the Bible says God is spirit. In our current rendition, we don't really look like that right now. So it can't be that. Could it be our sense of morality? Our understanding of good and evil? Well, demons and angels have that too, and they're never called images of God. So it can't be that. Maybe it's our ability to exercise logic and reason. Right? Well, there's plenty of other creatures in the animal world that do so as well. Now, granted, we have a greater capacity towards logic and reason, but it doesn't make us unique, does it? So what does the Bible mean when, when God says we are his image? Well, when you look at it in the Hebrew, the word image is solemn. The word salem means to be a representative figure. So when God says we are made in his image, we have been made to represent the creator of the universe. That's the answer to this philosophical question of who am I? You are a representation of the master and creator of all things seen and unseen. That's who you are. Now, If I have that perception of myself, that I am an imager of God, and he's an imager of God, how we interact will be based on that perception. So there's going to be a certain compassion, certain respect, because, you know, basically we're co-workers, right? We're both here to represent God. But what happens when we change that identity? And instead of being an imager of God, we're crayon colors. Because let's, let's be honest, nobody's really black. <laughs> There's some dark skinned people, uh, but you're not black, right? And even though John could use some tanning, he's not white. <laughs> he's not. But if I see him, instead of an image of God, I see him as a white man, right? He's just a crayon. and. I could do whatever I want to a crayon, couldn't I? Because mm. we use things, right? Yeah. I can manipulate things. So that love and respect is out the window. And that's the issue. That's why this is sin. Because we have removed our original identity as being an image of God and have taken on the identity from a fallen world who is in pl- complete disconnect with God. So... When we look at racism, though it's a a modern conception, the Bible definitely gives us a reference point when it comes to different people groups dealing with this contention of of race. Amen.
Do, you don't want to read First Corinthians? You're good? No. All right. Which brings us to a discussion of Jew and Gentile. And I'm going to actually go through this pretty fast so I can give Alfredo a little bit more time. You good with that? I'm good with right. that. We understand from our uh, reading in the Bible, and you can reference these three passages, that there was quite a lot of tension between these two people groups 2,000 years ago. And we get scriptural insight into how Jesus had the, the result in mind to destroy the wall of hostility between these two people groups. In Galatians 2, we see Paul opposing Peter to his face in front of others publicly because Peter was disassociating himself with some of the Gentiles at that time. He didn't want to drink from the same water fountain that they did. Didn't want to eat the same food that they did. So what does he do? He calls them out and says, that's not what Jesus came to do. Turns it around in front of everybody. And you know what's cool about Peter? He takes it. He's humble. He says, you're right. I need to fix that. That's not good. We need to be that way, that when we're called out on stuff, we can be humble and in love through dialogue, be able to figure out how to destroy the walls of hostility. In Ephesians chapter two, it talks about Jesus being sent, that him dying on the cross is what kills those walls of hostility. Sometimes we go through the process of becoming Christians. We repent of our sins. We are baptized. We experience the burial of baptism with Jesus as he died and raised to a new life. And yet we forget about the cross later on because the walls come back. And it's like putting Jesus on the cross all over again. And it's as if he's calling out from heaven. Don't you remember why I died? Remember your own conviction, how you decided that you were coming away from those beliefs. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, that we are no longer going to regard each other from a worldly point of view. That we are called to be ministers of reconciliation. Ministers of reconciliation need training. Mm -hmm. You know, they call uh, people ministers of finance or ministers of education. That took years and years and decades of training and education and experience. In the same way, we as ministers of reconciliation, we need training too, right? We need to learn and dialogue and not be the church that doesn't talk about stuff, but talks about it. And you know what? We might stumble through a little bit. I know I'm white and I'm preaching on race. Forgive me. Help me out. Let's talk about it. Let's work it out together so that we can all go to heaven arm in arm. Amen? All right. Amen. Back to you. So the gospel has that immense power to break down this wall. Amen. Right? And we see it happening within the first century, but we also need to see see it in our century. Right. So how do we in this year and this time with these people groups break down this wall? Right. So now each people group has a part that they play in breaking down this wall. So I would like to address the so-called white people in the audience right now. Okay. All right. So. Has who seen this movie? Right. This is a movie called Get Out. Amazing film. For those who haven't seen it, think of it as a Twilight Zone episode about cultural appropriation to the hundredth degree. That's probably the best way I could describe it. So, amazing movie, a lot of nuance, a lot of different messaging. So, one day in midweek service during fellowship, I'm talking to you know, some of the more melanated brethren. <laughs> and as we're talking, Mark Thompson comes and says, hey, are you guys talking about Get Out? Now, According to this crayon ideology, Mark would be considered a white man. I know that's shocking for some. So I turn to talk to Mark, and I have to be honest, in the back of my mind, I'm like, oh man, this is going to be the first time I talk about this movie with a white person, right? And if you saw the movie, you know how interesting that is, right? So now me and Mark, we always talk. We talk about Star Wars. The, the Marvel Cinematic Universe, The Walking Dead, and we just don't talk about it. We take deep dives. <laughs> it, is, it is a nerd fest. Pocket protectors show up. <laughs> it's amazing. It's amazing. So, so we're talking, and you know, Mark is brilliant. He understands how movies work, character development, plot twists, story arcs, right? So he gets the movie, but he doesn't assume that he gets the movie. He's asking me questions. In this scene, is this what they meant? Is this the messaging in in this particular part of the film? He wanted to understand. Because he knew that even though it was a movie, the the message is far greater than just what's been happening in the silver screen. Because Mark is a Christian. He understands that we live in a fallen world. And in a fallen world, hurt people hurt people. And racism is one of the ways that we hurt people. 
And Mark wants to understand how the more melanated of us are being hurt by the world. Because with that understanding comes the ability to have compassion. Because even if you don't relate, you can understand. And it's through that understanding that you can pray, you can talk, you can just hear people's stories. Just, just listening can do so much for someone. And if you have the heart to be compassionate, to feel for someone else, then God will open more doors to make us more family, because that's what we're supposed to be, right? Amen. Family. Now, we know when there's a disconnect. We know that you don't feel that way towards us. And if we see that, meaning those of us who are considered black, we are tempted to really start saying things from the perspective of a famous villain from a Marvel Cinematic Universe. I am now talking to the black people in the room. <laughs> Who's seen Black Panther? Raise your hand. Great, great. So I went to see Black Panther with my white woke friend, Mark Thompson. <laughs> and after the film, I told him, bro, you know, I know it's a comic book, but I just want you to know that you've been privy to a very in-house discussion. And he's like, what do you mean? It's like, when you're not in the room, we talk about what should be done to you. <laughs> and it's funny because there's people in the lobby around me and they're, they're, they're not like, they're, they're like, yep, yep. For us as black people, what is the appropriate response to the slave trade, to slave cropping, to Jim Crow, to apartheid? What should we do to you? This is a real conversation. This happens a lot. And many of us agree with this man because his, his rhetoric sounds like he wants justice, but in his actions, he wants revenge. And hatred can't be focused. Once hatred is allowed to roam, it goes wherever it pleases. You cannot weaponize your bitterness for the greater good. That's not how bitterness works. And we see that in the film, right? I hope I'm not giving any spoilers, but <laughs> there's the it's scene fault, where he man. burns, right, the, the, the bitter herb that, that's used to empower the king. So he's literally burning away the power of future leadership of his nation. Wow. Okay? And we see that when he does become king, right, how he treats his kingdom, his yeah. subjects. But I want justice. Do you? Do you want justice? Or are you just hurt and you're bitter and you want revenge? I have a feeling that Mr. Killmonger would not appreciate the teachings of Jesus. He just would not because his hatred would block him from understanding what it means to truly be a child of God. There is a quote from an amazing book called Jesus and the Disinherited. And I'm sure Mr. Kilmonga would have a hard time with this quote. It says, does he set his people to learn from him? For I am meek and lowly in heart. Yet ye shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. It was but natural that such a position would be deeply resented by many of his fellows who were suffering even as he was. This would have been quite true if Jesus had stopped there. He did not. He recognized with authentic realism that anyone who permits another to determine the quality of his inner life gives into the hands of the other the keys of his destiny. If a man knows precisely what he can do to you or what epithet he can hurl against you in order to make you lose your temper, your equilibrium, then he can always keep you under subjection. It is a man's reaction to things that determines their ability to exercise power over him. It seems clear that Jesus understood the anatomy of the relationship between his people and the Romans. And he interpreted that relationship against the background of the profoundest ethical insight of his own religious faith as he had found it in the heart of the prophets of Israel. So it is with compassion and it is with forgiveness that we as a church can break down these walls. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Hey, man. Thank you.